So glad and grateful for you all being here today and this evening. I mean, always, but I am really inspired to be here on Valentine's Day. It's kind of a relief, eh? Like, you don't need to try to be or do any of those other things. And I really think love is an interesting topic on the path of awakening. I'm really thinking about how love can support our awakening, how love can be a real big challenge and show us all the ways we need to grow. And tonight we're going to kind of investigate a little bit about how love is talked about in the Dharma in general, like how we heard about it in the book, Old Path, White Clouds, that we went through together, some stories that represent a type of love in which we suffer less, we're going to do a guided practice together in which we are attempting or investigating what it means to really feel love from within ourselves and towards ourselves, as well as the obstacles to that love within ourselves and toward ourselves. Then there's time, which I think there will be. We'll talk about how love of one another and love in romantic relationship is as uh, John Wellwood, a wonderful teacher and psychologist said, is a charnel ground. And if you don't know what a charnel ground is, it's a place in often in East Asia where uh, bodies are left when they're decomposing and the charnel ground or this graveyard, essentially an open graveyard, was considered to be one of the most advanced places for yogis to practice because you go there and you sit and you cannot deny impermanence. You, you see all the limbs and you see all the, you know, the animals and the vultures coming and you're just face to face with the reality. And so we will investigate why John Wellwood and Chogyam Trumpa say that love is a charnel ground. And the only place where we can truly understand our awakening and potential for awakening not in a really nice, beautiful place away from it all when our partner or kids or parents aren't around, but like right there, right in the trial ground, why that supports our awakening. So that's our arc for the evening. What I'd like us to do just to get started is, is settle in because I'm going to give a, a bit of framing before the practice. So let's give ourselves a moment to really find and connect with these three precious pills we've been working on. So I should say, if it's anyone's first time, welcome to the Dharma Collective. I'm Eve, one of the teachers here, and we are at the Well of Being. Often we're going through a text together. Tonight is a little bit of a, a special event for Valentine's Day, a deeper exploration in love. And one of the texts we're going through right now is really highlighting how we settle body, speech, and mind. This is an essential part of any meditation practice. It's considered preparatory, but as we've been doing here, settling body, speech, and mind is unbelievably deep and complex and arguably could bring us all the way to awakening. So in this initial practice, we'll start with these three phases of bodily setting, settling body, speech, and mind in natural states of stillness, silence, warmth, and openness. Probably be about a 10 minute practice. So go ahead and find a position that's comfortable for you. And engaging in a posture that's truly supportive. That posture should include two main elements, a sense of uprightness through the spine. And that uprightness bringing a vividness or dignity to the posture of practice. And finding and inviting the second quality, which is ease and relaxation. Maybe this is a softening or a gentleness through the face, the chest, the belly. And as you hear the bell to begin our practice, see if you can really sustain attention and awareness on the bell throughout the entire tone.
So begin by giving yourself this invitation to just let go. No longer holding on to thoughts and memories and images as though you could drop them like a heavy bag of stones. And instead invite all of your attention and awareness to the body. Consider the possibility that as we settle our body in its natural state, that natural state is one of stillness, like a mountain. Of course, the mind will get carried away once again. But each time you notice that it's been carried away, just relax and release and return. Finding attention and awareness saturating the body. Stillness is literal, as in our body is not actually going anywhere in this moment. But the stillness is also a choice or a preference. It's the intention to stay here with the body, not going away in the mind. And if we do, recommitting ourselves to this beautiful refuge of stillness. Inviting this preferencing or this noticing of stillness gives rise to all the sensations which are subtly moving through the body, a sense of aliveness or richness in the body. We then shift our attention and awareness to inner speech. And see if we can notice a quality of silence, especially by following the breath, giving ourselves that anchor. Mm -hmm. 
the attention, riding the breath closely. And when we find we've been carried away by a thought, memory, or image, how kindly can we return ourselves to this invitation of finding the silence naturally arising from stillness, the silence that doesn't mean there aren't thoughts and words and images, but the silence where we choose to place attention and awareness following the breath, and as much as possible, releasing that inner chatter, maybe just turning down the volume. And with this stillness and silence, we invite this sense of warmth and openness. This third of these three precious pills settling body, speech, and mind in their natural states. This sense of our mind as not necessarily somewhere above our shoulders or between our ears, but this sense of mind within the body, the vibrancy and awareness of the body, our sensory experiences, perceptions, and almost as though we were leaning back in our own mind, inviting a vast warmth and openness. It's like a clear day leaning back and seeing the phenomena of clouds moving by. Breathing in, see if you can notice the quality of vividness and vibrancy of mind and awareness. And breathing out, feeling and connecting with ease, presence.
couple more moments here, finding this really beautiful balance, not too tight, not too loose, here, open, awake, and present. Thank you all for your practice. Really nice to be practicing together. And again, for folks who are, are fr friendly and familiar regulars and folks who are new, just a reminder that this place that we create together each night when we come, we're kind of constellating a new community every single time. And a big part of what we do here in the Dharma Collective is really energize this idea, this kind of prophecy that the Buddha of the future is the Sangha, meaning the awakened being we are waiting for is all of us, right? The time of these Buddhas who comes down to lead us, maybe that is not our time. And that in fact, being in beloved community, as Dr. King would say, or being Kalyana Mitra, spiritual friends, that is how we are all going to support one another in waking up. And if that is a, if waking up seems like too lofty of a goal, support each other in becoming less difficult humans to live with. <laughs> more open hearted, right? More generous, more kind. We need each other to do that. We actually, you know, it's um, totally possible to learn a lot from books to train your mind, even with recordings, but to really bring, um, hearkening to John Wellwood here, heaven down to earth, to really be able to have our awake nature live in relationship with each other. We have to do that together. And that requires a certain level of respect and compassion for one another. So before we start a part of our time where there might be some discussion or reflection, just remembering that honoring each other as Buddhas, that's part of the path, right? It's harder to do at home. So like try it out here, see how it goes. Some folks familiar or unfamiliar. And, and if you come regularly, you might already have your judgments about other people. Like, oh man, I hope they don't talk again. <laughs> oh man, they talk a lot. I always know what they're gonna say, right? How can we really hold everything that happens here as the practice? as we're listening, as we're speaking, right? So that's the invitation. And we need it because, you know, as Mace was describing so beautifully last week, we actually can't practice if we don't feel safe, right? It's just really hard. It's kind of like driving your car in the wrong gear up a hill. And in order to feel safe, there has to be an invitation uh, at least and co-creating of care for one another. So is everyone into care for each other tonight? Yes. yes. Wonderful. If you want to come farther in, please do. How many chairs we have available? Two? Two. Cool. Three. Three. Okay. Anyone who wants to come in, come in. And there's plenty of Zafus. And there's plenty of Zafus in this place. In the study. All right. So we've been doing a bit of this stillness, silence, openness, but still, if anyone had a question about that practice, welcome. Did anyone have a question or wanna share? Everything okay back there? Sure, let's see. Let's get even moodier. 
Uh, I think it's the same for me up here. Okay. Yeah. Friends online, we're having some electrical questions. So just one moment. Does that feel okay for folks back there? Cage, are there two of these light show things? Is there one that could like shine a little light? back that way or would that mess everything up? No, no. Okay. Yeah, I Okay, we'll move stuff in the background. Oh, that's better. Does that work? Okay. If anybody gets scared, they can come sit in the front. <laughs> it's a little dark in the back here, friends online. So before I go ahead and we get started a bit on how to deeply love ourselves, terrifying, any questions <laughs> before we do that on that practice or any comments? Is it for folks who are coming more regularly? Is there starting to feel like, right? Yeah, like a little bit of, okay, I know what this is. This is kind of these tracks or these grooves. And if it was your first time, kind of reasonable? Stillness, silence, openness, and warmth? Okay, and take your nods as more or less. I was gonna say, it was, a, it was a little hard to orient coming from where I was coming from. Yes. I really appreciated what you said afterwards about safety and inviting safety yes. in there. And now that you've mentioned all of that, some cues to that to begin with probably would have helped a little bit to be able to prepare. Yes. Job. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. So for friends online, someone here mentioned that just like coming from where they were coming from, then, you know, showing up here, like it can be hard to just find that safety and cue to safety. So how can we bring that first off? So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, we are each, every, like other humans are where we get hurt and where we heal. That's very tricky. They, we create both. So, Many of you are familiar and aware of how we often talk about love in the context of the Dharma or in the context of Buddhist practice and meditation. And this is these four immeasurable practices, these four abodes of the heart, right? So that's loving kindness, compassion, rejoicing, and then this kind of wisdom to hold it all and a wisdom to be able to feel it boundlessly without preference for all beings. So sometimes there are certain people it's easy for us to feel love and care for, or compassion for, and others were like, yeah, I don't know, maybe not. Or if we feel compassion for them, it's as though we allow or accept bad behavior. And this equanimity is this way we kind of hold our heart so it can be open for all beings. And these practices, they are kind of they're like planting these very benevolent and beneficial seeds in our mind all the time. And the more that we practice, and some of us here when we did our, our New Year's ritual, we were committing to practice them every day, not meaning you need to sit formally for 10, 20, 30 minutes and practice, but that we could actually practice loving kindness every day, an aspiration for happiness for ourselves or others the desire that other beings suffer a little less, you know, this sense of rejoicing in the goodness of others. And I really like that idea of, you know, part of how we think about cultivating love and, you know, a sustainable love is planting those seeds all the time. And as some of you may remember, when we were going through Thich Nhat Hanh's beautiful book, Old Path, White Clouds, the Buddha has one sermon on how to love without pain. Uh, which is a very compelling title. Um, but essentially, you know, the message is it's without attachment and with wisdom. Sounds good in practice, extremely hard to do. And there's one or two stories he brings up. So you might, you know, you might remember the story that uh, of Ananda. So Ananda is Buddha's cousin and also attendant for most of his life. 
and Ananda, by all accounts, I mean, by all accounts, it sounds like Buddha was an extremely good looking man. <laughs> you know, like whenever you hear it's like, and he glowed and he was gorgeous. And I think Ananda had that family trait. So here he is, this ordained bhikkhu or monk, but you know, he's still a very handsome man and he's so kind and he's so generous. It makes sense that he would be the object of desire for others. And in one example, uh, Ananda is vi visiting a small village and he meets a young woman at the well and she's just so struck by, I think his looks, but also his kindness and his sweetness. And she has that feeling, it's so interesting with love, especially that kind of attached love, like she couldn't sleep at night. She couldn't eat. Like her mom was worried about her and said, what are we going to do? Like, you're not eating, you're not sleeping, you're going to get sick. And she said, like, I, I am sick. I <laughs> like, I can't, and I can't be well if I don't have him. Anybody ever felt that? Yeah, right. It's like this desire to the point of clinging. Like, if I don't have this, I can't be okay. Without this, I'm not well. And it's really, it's such an interesting thing that part of this human configuration, part of our, our ecosystem of emotions is desire and craving. We just want something. And we want it and it like burns us up, right? And whether that's a substance or a person or status or, you know, whatever else, it's so strong. It's not love, but it can happen when we're in love, which is so interesting, right? Love is not an emotion. Love is an enduring state in which many emotions arise, including anger, guilt, shame, joy. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> Just kidding. A lot of the time. But it's a lot of this. And so that craving, it's not actually love, but it's like this part of when we don't see clearly and we take that like desire as I need to possess, I need to own, I need to have this person. So this, uh, the, the mother of this woman who was very lovesick for Ananda agrees in a plot in which they're going to give a certain kind of potion or, or, or drug to Ananda so that he will fall in love with her. So she, Ananda comes over and accepts a meal at their house. She puts in this amazing potion. But Ananda, and this is an amazing aspect of you know being an attendant to the Buddha and learning these practices, he can reverse the poison or the not really the the potion, if you will. And so he goes into the state of like total absorption, doesn't succumb. And, you know, at, at mealtime, they notice that Ananda's missing. And so some of the monks go out to look for him and they find him in this state of repose and bring him back to the temple. And then the woman comes to this main monastery where Ananda is and the Buddha is. And she's, she's just, you know, tearful and crying and she says i i really don't want to live if i can't be with him and the buddha gives this beautiful sermon on if what you really feel is love for ananda then you would rejoice in what brings him happiness so this part of love that is actually rejoicing in what someone else is you know virtuous in or good at or loves or cares for and it's funny I think in our romantic relationships, we definitely can rejoice in, you know, the goodness of, of someone who we're involved with. But can we really sustain that rejoicing if we're no longer involved with them? Like if we've broken up with them, they're no longer like ours. So it starts to highlight the kind of contingent ways we might have some of these four immeasurables in romantic relationships. So it's not really that boundless like i rejoice no matter what i want you to be happy even if you dumped me it's like mm. <laughs> for most of us like that's really tough right and what buddha was asking her is can you please like rejoice in what ananda truly loves and that's being on the path of awakening being with his dharma friends and family here and it definitely took her a little while, but Buddha did, you know, as he does so beautifully, this long discourse and asking her all these questions and inquiring, like, what is a true source of happiness? Because let's say, you know, he didn't say this, but I can imagine, okay, so Ananda leaves 
the monastery and becomes your partner and maybe for a couple months, maybe even a year, it's just really exciting. And then he's like your partner and he's annoying and he's not great sometimes and sometimes he's great and right. It's not your true source of happiness. That type of infatuation is putting so much on another being, right? And it is really difficult for us, those interested and who care about awakening. And, and when I say awakening, I mean, really just seeing clearly life as it is and being able to operate from that place. You know, I love the definition of enlightenment or awakening as becoming more fully who you truly are. So without all that aversion and craving and delusion, right? Just this fullness of who you are, not someone else, like who you are. And if we're in romantic relationship with others, it can really be tough unless they're supportive and engaged in making relationship part of the spiritual path. There's another story in of the Buddha. So in in this uh in this, you know, kind of weaving of the Buddha's life, there is an idea and a concept that he's actually been through many lifetimes working his way towards enlightenment. It's not that he was born this prince, left for seven years, found awakening, like he many lifetimes earned that. And in many lifetimes, he was actually married to his wife, Yasudhara. And the first time he met her, many lifetimes before he was the Buddha, he was following a spiritual master who he knew would help him get farther along the way to awakening. And the spiritual master was coming to a town and he had nothing to offer him. He was just a, a wandering yogi at the time. And he sees a woman who has a whole handful of beautiful lotus flowers. And he thinks, oh gosh, maybe she'll give me a lotus flower and I can offer it to this great master. I wanna learn from him. So she, he goes over to this woman with a lotus flower and she has that same immediate, oh my God, I'm in love with this guy. Like this, wow, I'm in love. I, and he says, you know, can I please have one of these flowers? And she's kind of trembling and shy and says, I can give you all of these flowers if you will spend your life with me. Not quite an offer. <laughs> and, um, doesn't, you know, and, uh, and he says, you know, you know, you seem to be, you know, I think clear of heart and, a, you know, wholesome being, but I'm committed to awakening. Like I cannot have a partner or anything that's in the way of that path. This is what I need. And her, her love and actually in some ways commitment in that moment, she can see clearly, She's, she says, I will make sure I support you all the way to enlightenment this lifetime and everyone ahead. And so they made this kind of pact together to be instead of I'm going to look for happiness in you, this clarity of I'm going to look for happiness and enlightenment and I'll be with you. So yeah, kind of a beautiful other um, other way. And we see there this difference between the kind of possessive love, right? Of I love you and need you and want you for mine. And maybe that wisdom and that wisdom, that ability to really love someone as they are requires empathy, seeing them clearly, understanding with compassion, their limitations also being able to rejoice again in their goodness. So now onto the hard part, loving oneself. Anyone find that easy? Like totally loving yourself, all parts, all times. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not, I don't see anyone online. Anyone raise their hand online? find that easy okay shaking heads yeah yeah and it's really interesting because it's really tough often when we think of loving ourselves or when we you know kind of vacillate between like i'm the worst i'm the best we go from this really inflated sense of like i did something great i'm great and then you know misfortune falls and you think, God, I suck and I'm bad. And you're kind of riding, you know, samsara, right? You're riding the waves of good fortune, ill fortune, praise and blame. They're called these eight worldly winds. 
So the kind of loving of ourselves is not that self-cherishing, not that making of ourselves as I'm so great. Right? I'm so oh. And usually when we have that, it's a very external, like I'm so great because I look this way, because I'm smart, because I achieved this, because I have this, right? This kind of externally validated sense of self-love. But a true love of oneself, just like a true love of another, is without boundary, without contingency. Not like I love myself when I eat well and I exercise. Right. But I love myself even when I don't eat well and when I like forgot to exercise for a month. Right. And that's when we can really start to see the obstacles of self-love, the ways that that kind of core sense of insufficiency, not good enough, kind of manifests as criticism. So establishing a sense of like this true and deep and boundless love for ourselves. It's really, it's really connecting with what's often called our Buddha nature, our basic goodness. This can be a leap of faith for us, like to believe that there's some part of me, maybe the essential part of me, that's good. Anybody have some, like, sorry, everyone here, no one raised their hand that high about self-love. Anybody here that feel that some part of you is intrinsically good or okay? Okay, we're on to something. If you, if you didn't raise your hand, you know, it's just worth considering, like, what's in the way? Is it something you did in the past, right? Is it some story about yourself you're not living up to? It's really interesting the ways we withhold love from ourself. And often it looks a lot like the way we withhold love from others, right? So often this practice of giving ourselves love, it can be, again, confused and fall into the self-cherishing, like I'm so great. Um, but it can also, you know, it can get really tricky and really help us see where we need to bring in some ways like our wounding to the spiritual path and the way that's described more traditionally is like kleshas or our difficult disturbing emotions and also our delusion what are we not seeing clearly right we i think most of us believe that other beings can be good even if they've done wrong right you're mostly in the Dharma Center, I assume you believe that, right? Why wouldn't we extend that to ourselves? It's, it's an interesting question. And part of it is this root delusion, you know, like what's really beneath this difficulty in fully opening ourselves to love? It would be called ignorance, not seeing clearly, believing we are separate and different than others. So it's really kind of beautiful how this love of ourself is not just, you know, self-optimization project. It's really how we can show up in the world with everybody else. We really need to identify and understand how connected we are and how all of us have this capacity, this innate Buddha nature, this goodness. I love how Matthew Ricard calls it really like the gold of our heart. It's always there, but these kleshas or difficult emotions like shame, anger, fear, you know, they're like the dust on the gold. And through practice, it's like we're kind of dusting off that gold of our heart. Questions, comments, objections? <laughs> What do you, what do you, yeah. Do you, and do you mind someone could bring the mic? The mic uh, for folks who are new here, it won't amplify you in the room. It just allows folks at home to hear. Um, I just wondered, could you um, spell Kleisha and um, talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. It's K L E S H A, Kleisha. Sometimes, um, and sometimes it's translated as difficult disturbing or defiling emotion. 
and and Klesha's, you know, I it's interesting. This was like a great place of meaningful overlap between contemporary psychological science and these more ancient wisdom practices. Because in contemporary psychological science, no emotion is bad or wrong, but the way that we react to it can be quite harmful. So if we feel angry and it leads us to have a protest and you know stop traffic on the bridge, that might be beneficial, right? But if we feel angry and we like take it out on someone who doesn't deserve it, then we then we're in the territory of Klesha. We're kind of deluded. Our emotions are very useful and helpful momentarily, but often when we are in the grip of our emotion, we don't see things very clearly. We see things through the lens of that emotion. So there's always this potential for them to kind of project onto a situation that which isn't there. So, yeah, and, and Klesha's, you know, um, Pema Chodron, she talks about it as uh, it's this itch. And like, you know, whether it's frustration or jealousy or anxiety, and we just want to scratch it. Like, oh, I just want to think about that. <laughs> but just like having poison oak, like we scratch the itch, like it just gets bigger. And so, you know, the way to be with our is to see them clearly, uh, sometimes it's called, you know, experiencing them purely like, wow, that's making my mind feel really hot and spiky and there's energy in my body. And okay. Right. Just really seeing it clearly and letting it naturally pass it might be in the moment. And then the other, so there's like the, in the moment strategies of how we work with these disturbing, defiling or difficult emotions. And then there's the reflective practices of being able to understand where they come from and why. So that's a little more. Yeah, thanks for the question. Anybody else? Yes, and do you mind? Thank you. I just kind of had to laugh a little bit because we have this very common call to may all beings be, may all beings be, and then we kind of forget ourselves as one of those beings. Absolutely. I know, it's so, and it's it's so true, you know? And this idea, I think, of may all beings not including us is ridiculous, right? Like, of course we are one of them. Like, how could we not be? Like, are we, yeah, but it's true. It's like, we're cordoned off to the side and everybody else. And it is, it's so tricky. And, and I will say, when I first started hearing about the popularity of self-compassion, did make me feel like a little like sick, kind of like, I was like, oh God, come on. We really need like selfie, selfing, selfing, right? Um, and yet we do <laughs> is the truth, right? And it's very hard for us to offer compassion skillfully to others. If it's not coming from a fully forged vessel of compassion within us, and we just don't want to stop there. So self-compassion, oh my God, all the time. I, I might've said this here, but if the president of the world said, what would one thing that everyone can do and I'll make them do it? self-compassion no question but don't stop there like don't stop there that's not the point it's not to then feel okay so you can continue in your worldly pursuits it's then bring it to the world right yeah thank you anybody yes yeah, tell us how you've learned to love yourself <laughs> yes. um I just recognize that I try hard and my foibles are very human. Like I can't go beyond them. Nobody Beautiful. could really. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. So we're going to move towards another practice. This will be a loving kindness practice for ourselves, And it really is going to be an invitation to, you know, um, Approach and hold yourself with love. See and feel love that's already within you. And then recognize what's in the way. So it's loving kindness and compassion. And so I just want to spend one more moment on love. Kind of a big word, gets used a lot. So when I say love, what do, what do folks think? You can just kind of say it out loud. Like, what is that? What's love? Connection, 
affection, care, care acceptance, acceptance, respect, valuing. What's it feel like? Non-judgment. Non Thanks, Chris. Warmth. It feels like warmth. Yeah. Adoration. Yeah. What was it? Fellowship. Fellowship. And fellowship. Yeah. Yeah. Expansive. Expansive. Yeah. Supportive. Shared sense of suffering. Shared sense of suffering. I like that. <laughs> yeah. And it is, you know, even talking about it can feel good. Right. And again, the kind of love I'm inviting us to find is, is not a fabricated contingent love, meaning not love because I did this or love because I did that, but just this essential feeling of care, connection, support, warmth. This is natural, right? Not just for us, but all living beings at some level. So I want to read a poem and then go into this practice. And some of you may be <clears throat> familiar with this poem. It's Sri Nisargadatta. I always get that one hard. His book, which is so beautiful, is called I Am That. Some of you may know it's recognizing the spiritual, which is already here. And this poem or this excerpt from a poem, I think is quite helpful. So I'll read it once, highlight it, and then we'll practice. All you need is already within you. Only you must approach yourself with reverence and love. Self-condemnation and self-disgust are grievous errors. Your constant flight from pain and search for pleasure is a sign of love you bear for yourself. All I plead with you is this, make love of yourself perfect. Deny yourself nothing. Give yourself to infinity and eternity and discover that you do not need them. You are beyond. And what I really appreciate about, you know, this love poem to oneself, this, you know, this plea, all you need is already within you. It's just approaching yourself with reverence and love. And that actually, you know, even coming here, everything we do to avoid pain and move towards pleasure. So whether that's bringing a raincoat so you don't get soaking wet and then cold and catch a chill and eating good food because it tastes good. All of that is a sign of the love that you bear for yourself. It doesn't have to be so complicated. Yeah. Explain what you mean by that practice. Oh, then we will meditate formally. Um, I, yeah, I will ring the bell, good behavioral cue. And then we'll do a guided practice of like bringing love towards oneself. Okay. What are we supposed to do? After, After sorry? After, so you ring the bell. Yeah. Yes, I will. Yeah, great question. So I will invite everyone to, if it's comfortable, close their eyes like we did in the beginning and kind of settle in. And then what's interesting about compassion practices and a lot of these immeasurable practices, they invite visualization. So it's not just focusing on the breath or the body. They actually invite us to imagine, bring to mind. And not just to do so because it's, you know, helpful and feels good, but it really actually, it's, it is like going to the gymnasium, but the gymnasium of compassion and kindness. Like we're exercising this imagination of love towards ourselves. We're trying it out. And so that will be in like simple guided ways. And what's interesting about, again, these visualization practices, it can feel a lot like, are you asking me to think as I meditate? And it's a little bit like I'm trying to think of the right word. Like when you listen to a song, you're not thinking about it, but it's moving you. You're hearing it. And the same way the words might give forth or give rise to feelings and images. So that's the process. Sound good? Give it a try. 
Yeah, I was just you keep you, you said it several times and then the practice. Yeah. But not for the same thing every time. So I'm just curious what that key what's that doing mean? When we ring the bell and then we meditate. Practice. Yeah. Yeah. And if after it seems, especially after the bell is rung, it feels like unclear, then let's come back and, and see what that's like. Sound good? Anybody else? Question, uncertainty? Yeah. I will not recommend that, but we take Yeah. So how does loving kindness differ from compassion is the question. Loving kindness is our, our heartfelt aspiration for another to be happy and know the causes of happiness. So we can kind of feel that like, wow, may I feel that sense of aspiration that another being be really happy. With compassion, we want them to be free from suffering. And so in order for them to be happy, they need to be free from suffering, but they're different aspirations. And we kind of hold them in different ways in terms of when we're like wishing that, what is the kind of quality or experience of our practice? And often they are kind of grouped together in more contemporary secular context, but really they are practiced, you know, in complementarity, but not uh, as the same thing. Yeah, great question. So I'll read the poem one more time, then I'm going to ring the bell. We'll go into a guided meditation. Oh yeah, I'm going to sit properly too. All you need is already within you. Only you must approach yourself with reverence and love. Self and condemnation, self condemnation and self disgust are grievous errors. Your constant flight from pain and search for pleasure is a sign of the love you bear for yourself. All I plead with you is this make love of yourself perfect. Deny yourself nothing, give yourself to infinity and eternity, and discover that you do not need them. You are beyond. I'm taking a moment, reestablishing these qualities of posture, a sense of uprightness, vividness, maybe a lengthening through the spine, as well as ease and softening through the face, heart, belly. And take a moment and reconnect to these qualities of stillness, silence, warmth, and openness. I'm taking a moment to really notice the sensations in the body with precision. We're noticing areas of warmth or tingling, areas of movement or heaviness.
Noticing where these sensations are arising. Is there sensations through the face or the chest, belly? Almost as though you were mapping the body. Investigate and explore the sensations and find this curiosity and kindness or whatever arises in the body. Noticing even the changes in the body when you get distracted by a sound or an itch. And then what's it like? How does that shift and change experience in the body? Then we shift our attention away from the body and sensation into the mind and imagination. And take a moment and considering this simple phrase, I'm holding myself with love and reverence. I'm holding all of myself with love and reverence. Seeing and feeling how that lands in the heart. And silently repeating it. And bringing it into the breath. As we inhale, really feeling a presence of ourself right here in this moment. And as we exhale, imagining holding ourselves with love, with care, with kindness. So simple, such a subtle shift. It's just the mind. And yet the mind is where we live. Everything is created. So for a couple more moments, trying this simple, yet maybe challenging practice of intentionally holding ourselves with love and reverence, care and kindness.
really consider noticing what it means to hold us, all of ourselves, with this kindness and care. Not just the parts we like, all of us. Holding ourselves with a kind of care that is so simple. Like a mother to a crying child in the night. Just that care, that love. Taking a moment and seeing if you can notice what does love feel like in the body? Has anything shifted or changed in the body? Areas of sensation, qualities of sensation. Considering this simple phrase, this is a body of love. This is a body deserving of love, capable of love. And again, using the breath and inhale, feeling yourself present here. Exhale, feeling this body. This is a body of love. This is a body capable of loving, being loved. It's okay if it's awkward or unfamiliar. It's an exercise. Developing a different kind of imagination and care. Seeing if you can push aside self-consciousness, newness, and just try it on for a couple more breaths. Noticing what might be tenderized or open. Noticing what might be you know, clamped down and hard. Welcome all of it. Keep breathing, holding oneself. If it feels really out of reach, no problem. Consider, I imagine holding all of myself with love. I imagine this body as a body of love. So this practice of really applying this love to ourselves may help us see and reveal what's in the way. Maybe there's a sense of hardness, a gripping, maybe a thought or image getting in the way. Maybe just numbness, not being able to feel at all.
now shifting to compassion, deep sense of care for whatever is in the way of loving ourselves completely. And this compassion is a sense of desire to be free from suffering. The heart's quivering in the face of whatever is painful or difficult. And taking a couple moments and recognizing and seeing the pain or difficulty that might be in the way of love. This could feel heavy or difficult. And keep breathing. Keep imagining that there is enough space for this feeling. And as we breathe in, we are present with whatever obstacle we have met or found. And when we breathe out, may I be free. May I feel love. And breathing in, being with ourselves. Breathing out, and extending compassion. And taking a moment here and really considering, is there a word or phrase? Maybe it's a line from a song. Maybe it's something our close friend would say to us, a word of compassion and care. Could just be, I love you, I'm here with you. I got you. Take a couple moments and think of that word or phrase. And gently placing one palm on the heart, a signal of compassion. Breathing in here with ourselves. Breathing out, extending that word or phrase. I'm here, I love you, I got you. And with our next breath, imagining all the beings in this room and online in their rooms, bringing them to mind, all of us with our obstacles to love and challenges. Letting the heart expand and open. And with our exhale, sending that love to each of us. I got you. I love you. I'm here with you. Breathing in, holding each other in mind. And breathing out, extending that love and care. Reconnecting, noticing the body. What's here now? What's present in the face, the chest, the belly? And then widening our sphere of concern a bit and imagining not only the beings in this room, but let's go for the beings in this city. May all the beings in this city have an opportunity to know what's in the way of love. Breathing in, bringing everyone to mind. Breathing out with that phrase and word of love. I love you here with you, I got you. I'm feeling the strength of that capacity and potential to hold others in our heart right along with us. A couple more times on the rhythm of your own breath, really feeling 
this incredible exercise, opportunity, opening, expanding, extending. Everybody just like us wants to feel love and know what's in the way of love. May they all meet that. May we all meet that. Releasing the phrase on the next breath, releasing the hand if it's still on the heart. And coming back to the breath, feeling the body on the ground. Feeling the gentle touch of air coming in and out of the nostrils. Thank you for your practice. Really gently come out of that practice. So will you guys grab these markers here in the room? Take one. I'd like you to write the phrase, your phrase of compassion on that heart. For friends online, can you please write your phrase of compassion in the chat so others can see it? So we'll be passing these markers around. Yeah, anybody missing a heart? Are the pens making their way back there? Just got one pen. Yes. We have one heart. Heart, heart, heart. Okay, everybody's got them. Anybody need a heart? <laughs> oh, good tall. Thanks. Can I borrow your pen? If we could do this with as little talking as possible, that would be awesome. <laughs> All right. Does everybody have a right heart that is written on? Anybody need more time? Still writing. Still writing. Okay. You can pass your pens back to the front. We want these pens forever. Or as long as they want to live with us. Yeah. All right. Anyone still need more time? You got to wait. Okay. All right, everybody done? 
So now you're going to pass your heart left. Uh huh. I'm to the left. Thank you. Mm, whoever doesn't, who doesn't have a heart? Yeah. Keep passing. Keep passing. 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 Check it out, but then pass it. Oh. It's okay. You can read the next one. Keep passing. Oh, some to the back. It's randomized. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Fully random. Oh, wow. I got three here. I'll read them out for, for friends online. You're okay. I love you. I see you. I'm holding you. I love you. Keep going. I got you. I'm going to keep one of these. All right. That one. Okay. And then whatever one you're with. <laughs> okay. Who doesn't have one? Okay. Yay. So, and for friends online, Feel free to write out a little heart, and we'd love to hear from the chat. Jason, would you share a couple of what people wrote? Glad to. Uh, starting from where you started, I love you. I'm here for you. I got you. Mm -hmm. May I be free. I love you. <laughs> I'm sticking with you. <laughs> I got you, heart. What do you need? Hmm. I'm here for you. Nothing. Okay. And then one more. I love you now and forever. Aww. So for folks here, this is your Valentine donated by somebody special in this room. It's their heart's desire. Uh oh. Are we down one? Does anybody have a oh oh Jorge has a couple. That's generous to give them up. And when one more back here. Okay. When we are done this evening in 10 or 15 minutes in the back room, um, Daniel brought not only these hearts and Karen, and Karen but also these beautiful, you know. Um, pom poms, and there's all sorts of bedazzling you can do on your Valentine if you want to bring it home. And yeah, I wanted to hear from folks. What was that like? That wasn't like a beginner level practice of self love, but I think, you know, worth trying. And again, it's okay if like the whole time you're like, I don't get it, I don't like it, I don't want it, or whatever else. Yeah, Paige, please. Oh, oh um, then run. Yeah. Um, yeah, this one was, I think, a little extra than just like, may we all be happy and healthy and safe. Um, and I think it was primed by Gladys when she first said the loving kindness and compassion, because that really clicked in for me. Hmm. Um, because uh, the first one was really pretty easy and no problem. But then when it got a little tender, when you asked to bring the compassion to that, like that was a lot harder and more challenging. And yeah. It seemed really clear that the difference between compassion and the loving mm. kindness. So that was really beautiful for me in the practice. And did you find, was it like um, bringing compassion to the kind of obstacle? Did it... <laughs> soften or did it just kind of yeah. okay. no it, it, it softened yeah. it, it softened but it was i um, i got a little teary-eyed i think just like a Great. bit <laughs> yeah not a problem yeah and yeah. just like how to take some deep breaths yeah. like oh that's still there and yeah um yeah but it, it was it was nice thank you yeah thanks cage ron yeah oh, thank you mm. Just sharing our experience, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Or question. 
Yeah. Oh, that was incredible. Um, so the feeling, you know, of um of love in the body, the as as it was coming up. I mean, it, it, you know, it started as it changed, and there was there there's some intensity, like tears of joy, mm. but but mostly where I ended up is just this 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 well of being i mean i i have to say like like if the drugs that i took were you know worked you know when when i used to take a lot of drugs yeah yeah i think the best one ever that's the yeah. kind of that's kind of what it just this 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 beautiful well of being that but then felt like hmm. like strength and like and like openness to anything like i could like i i, I got the world here hmm. and i don't need anything there's nothing i need yeah that kind of feeling and Beautiful. then yeah and then obstacles were like there's several and you know distractions mm -hmm. you know so so i'm like i'm like here what's keeping me from being here yeah all the time was distractions habits strategies <laughs> right but then the one that got me was this, you know, this, this um, a self image of that I don't deserve this, that I didn't, yeah. you know, I knew it used to be there. I've worked on it a lot, but it's, it still lives. Yeah. It's still there, hmm. you know, and bringing the compassion to that was, was, was fantastic. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Such a beautiful reflection of the openness that you bring to your practice. Yeah. Thank you for sharing with us anyone else and i will say that like deserve man that's like i hate that word like you deserve it it's like i don't know it, it's not that's not compassion and that's not kindness it's like this weird contingency like we all are love we all can love and be loved the deserve part it is it's such this kind of moralistic shame mongering feeling Oh, anyway, thank you. Oh, yeah, I just, I had to laugh at myself a little bit because my first thought was, well, I could love myself if I didn't have so many faults. <laughs> and that sort of was like that, I realized I bring that lens to the world a lot. And so it was just, so I could work, I could, it was a low bar, but I could start from there. And yeah. it was, it was, it, was um, it, it turned out better. <laughs> it was, it was really eye-opening. Beautiful. I love it. Yeah. And the humor, like both of you brought up humor tonight such a good part of the path is like laughing at the ridiculousness of these barriers and limitations. Yeah. Um, you said this is a body of love and I was like, Whoa, <laughs> this. <laughs> and then you gave an instruction to put our hand and I was like, I felt it so truly like it makes me feel so tender right now mm. you know I was like, oh, look at this. Mm -hmm. and that mostly the tenderness mm -hmm. came from the simplicity of like literally just connecting yourself yeah. to yourself making it somatic yeah um and then when you asked you know what what would someone else say right and it came I'm glad you're here mm. and the hand was still here and then it was like I'm glad you're here. It's like, hmm. fuck, it's so simple, <laughs> but it's not. Yeah. But like, what if I did just that every day? Yeah. Just that. Mm -hmm. Great question. Wonderful research experiment. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it is that like subtle, like, I, you know, who like it's funny when you start really looking and listening to every love song as a love song to yourself, <clears throat> like like a deep longing to like to feel like that deep love to yourself. Like it's really cool. Like it really is like, oh, I'm the one I've been waiting for. And again, not so that I create this like cozy, wonderful place and I don't need anyone. It's then so like, yeah, I don't know if you all notice, but then extending that out it's like natural, right? Being able to extend it out to others. Yeah. Yes. It's 
So I think I had a more negative experience than a lot okay. of people, probably. So sorry if it's a downer. Sure it's not an Yeah. I feel like I sort of failed the assignment. Because oh. Okay, tell me. What happened? In the failure to feel much during the practice, yeah. all I was probably feeling was like bad uh -huh. things about myself for being unable yeah. to feel it. Yep. <laughs> so yeah. It's like a reverse of what you're meant to feel, I think. But I you know, but I don't think it's I actually think it's on the way in this in this strange um kind of paradox of like being able to see the like, wow, this is hard to feel. And being hard to feel can happen for so many reasons we can be tired we can be too full we could be you know too caffeinated like not being able to feel in the moment when we're practicing totally normal but seeing the way we then like shut down on ourselves that's really instructive and then you know it's interesting it's helpful for me to hear because i can like do that reminder of like meet and love whatever is here mm -hmm. right and I'm curious if like, if that, if, was there a moment where you're like, oh, I'm being hard and actually I'm okay. Probably, but then in the attempt to love the hard feeling, if you fail at that, it, you know, it's kind of recursive. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so then where, like, when, it, what about when it was extending to others? Was that like- I have a, generally a much easier time with that. Yeah. Than... yeah. And so I think- you know, there's a reason why these practices are taught in different ways. And sometimes we start with others and then bring it to us because it's like we're using the momentum of that. And, you know, I think that can be a way. And, you know, I would say, like, I'm sorry for that experience, but I'm, I'm not. Like, I really, seeing these obstacles is really important, you know? Yeah, I'm not blaming the practice. Yeah. It means. <laughs> it's great. That. You don't want your money back. You don't want your money back. Uh, I think it's, uh, but I do think it is, like, it is so tender to see, you know, that kind of, especially that, it's like a snowball of, like, I'm not doing this wrong. I suck at this. This is bad. And I hear really experienced people in, like, various, you know, realms of, meditation or shamanism or whatever and they're like oh i'm bad at meditation or i suck and i'm like whoa it's really an opportunity to um just see the harshness on ourselves and and it also might be that we find the practices that feel more useful like does was the opening practice more like easeful or was it like the stillness yeah i would say so but they yeah. they feel kind of like different yeah, in their totally. goals yeah, and not one is not better than the like other. Complementary, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And so I think even being able to have that confidence of there's practices that really support me and practices that are harder. So, thank you so much for sharing that. Very brave. You actually get an extra heart. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, Jason. Online, friend, please. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say uh, that at a certain point um, when I was noticing the feeling of love, uh, it felt, I was just going like, oh, pleasant. And then yeah. I said, very pleasant. <laughs> it was like, whoa, bubbly, uplifting, buoyant. And then it just opened up into this feeling that was so... Um, it's kind of like awake, awakening, you know what I mean? And I've, I think in any time I've ever had any touch of that, it's always been love that was the mm -hmm. thing. It was like love was the, the the seed, the plant, everything. And it was, so I, I, I just connected with that. And I was kind of writing it like, wow, you know, this is cool. And then it was just like this very uh, equanimity experience. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah, beautiful. And I want to, um, I wanted to share, we didn't get so much into the charnel ground, but Isaac, I think you'll appreciate this, which is like a Chogyam Trumpa quote, the chaos that takes place in your neurosis is the only home ground that you can build the mandala of awakening upon. Mm -hmm. Right? So really like, the chaos that takes place in your neurosis, like your self-criticism, your planning mind, your comparing mind, is the only home ground that you can build the mandala of your awakening upon, 
Meaning like, don't try to find that nice because having, you know, feelings of bliss and openness on the practice, amazing, nourishing, helpful. But like, how do we get the work done? It's like seeing our shit. So good work, everybody who had a hard practice. <laughs> good work, everybody who had a, you know, um, practice of tenderness and beauty. And let's uh, take a moment and dedicate the merit here. So yeah, maybe taking a hand back on the heart and really feeling that sense of connection, that tactile, somatic feeling, and bringing to mind that word or phrase that really supported us. And once again, bringing to mind our very reason for being here tonight, awakening heart and mind for the sake of all beings. And if there's been any benefit to our practice and our energy here, we dedicate it out and symbolically offering it to all beings. May each and every being know their love. May each and every being feel and experience love. May each and every being see and remove the obstacles to love. May we all be free. Thank you, Cage and Daniel, for making such a beautiful place for us to practice. Thank you, Mace, for the chocolate. We need to eat it. <laughs> yeah. It's really, it's just fun to be, yeah, celebrating in community and like deepening our practice together through love. Maybe we'll do one more thing on love another time. Such a rich, juicy topic. I know we have some announcements coming up. I'll just say briefly, Big Bear Retreat in April, three days, April 11th, 12th, 13th. There's still space. Um, Esalen in May, 10th, 11th, 12th. I think there's still space. I'm doing a half day here next, March 16th, and then April 21st. So kind of getting in our rhythm of doing half days here every month. So please join. And what else do we Friday Oh, yeah. Thank Good call. You. Thanks. I'm doing a talk actually for Big Bear, but it's online. I tried to do it here, but the timing didn't work out. But this is a, a talk I gave probably like six or seven years ago at Against the Stream on what does it mean to use the words to describe emotion or the language of emotion. And so it'll be online at seven. And uh, yeah, it's a really, it's like a really interesting topic of language, thought, and feeling, and then a practice with handshake of emotion. And is there a sound bath here? Is that this week? Or last, last week. week. Sorry, you missed it. <laughs> Where is the, 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 the online deal Friday available? Yeah, I think it's, here? it's on our website. Yes. Yes. Is that, is that cool? this Friday? Oh, this Friday. Friday the... Seven, 16th, 16th, 7 yeah. to 8.30. Yeah. It's called All Up In My Feelings. All Up In My Feelings. <laughs> there's one other thing really quick, which is that Saturday, there's this really cool awareness and improv half oh, yeah. day, which is offered by these two lovely humans from Santa Cruz Insight. Also only online because I believe they'll be in Santa Cruz and you all be wherever you are. You should yes. I, I announced as a Thursday last night. I was well. I'm just reading. The, yeah. the improv is Saturday. Okay. Saturday. Yeah. Saturday. Okay. So that's ten to three, and then there's a peer led half day oh, cool. here on Sunday, and you can come in at any time or on Zoom anytime, Sweet. and just sort of sit, walk, sit, walk, sit, walk. Um, and then the last thing is that this center is really run on people's donations. And so it's meaningful and important to us if you give what you can, what's right for you. And there's lots of ways to take it. So this is the deal. You'll come through, give a donation, eat a lot of chocolate, take yes. a sticker. And get bedazzled. And hang out and get bedazzled. In the oh, bathroom. there's bling for hearts and there's more hearts back there. And there's some stickers. Mm -hmm. So people want to hang out, do a little sangha stuff. 
Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Great to see you. Thanks, everybody.